Tipsy Sake recently asked if I'd be interested in promoting their Taste of Japan snack set. I said yes and began writing a video about Japanese drinking culture. The video ended up becoming a little bit serious, however, and I don't want to put an advertisement in the middle of a serious video, so I'm going to talk about their product now, and the video will play after that. So this is Tipsy's Taste of Japan snack set. It comes with an assortment of authentic otsumami, or snacks that are paired with alcohol. In the past, I tried a couple of Tipsy's sake products, and I was very impressed by their attention to the culture and the stories behind the sake as well, so I'm pleased to see that they've expanded their lineup to talk more about izakaya culture in general. And the box comes with an assortment of authentic Japanese snacks that are designed to enhance your drinking experience. And these can be paired not just with sake, but also wine, whiskey, beer, and cocktails. And if there are any snacks that you really enjoy, you can order those individually at Tipsy Marketplace. I think of all the snacks, this one, the Yaki Iwashi, is probably my favorite. I like sardines because of the low mercury amount, but then also the high amount of omega-3s. And these ones also come with some daikon oroshi and tone. Some grated radish, but then also some soy sauce as well to enhance the flavor. That said, it's hard to go wrong with the classic, the kakitane, the kind of baked Japanese rice crackers. These are served basically in bars and izakaya all over the country. If you're going to be drinking in Japan, these will almost certainly show up. I look forward to sharing these snacks with my YouTube buddies the next time they're out in Beppo, and I would encourage anyone out there that's interested in Japanese drinking culture to give the box a try. Use code DOGEN5 for $5 off all products. Thank you very much to Tipsy for sponsoring this video and giving me the opportunity opportunity to talk at length about Japanese drinking culture. I didn't have any alcohol until I was 25 years old, three years after graduating from university and several years after I had already been living in Japan. So believe me when I say I understand why many people choose not to drink. That was me. I was always the square guy at parties having water or ginger ale. But now I do drink, albeit only a few times a year. So what happened? Why did I go from never drinking in the United States, never drinking during high school or university, to sometimes drinking in Japan. To understand this, I think we need to break down American and Japanese culture, as well as each country's respective drinking cultures. Now, I didn't feel this way until after I left the US, but I find American culture to be fascinating, specifically the openness that Americans have. Americans, for better or for worse, do what they want. They wear what they want to wear, say what they want to say, and act how they want to act. I mean, take the public schools. The kids don't all wear the same uniform. Again, they wear what they want to wear. You've got the goth group, you've got the trendy kids, you've got people like me who just wear the same thing every single day. Take politics. You've got people on both sides of the political aisle that'll put stickers on their car and signs on their lawn that say who they're supporting. And the lifestyle variety. In the United States, you could be walking down the sidewalk and see the most jacked, buff dude you've ever seen in your life. And right behind him could be someone who has McDonald's once a day. What you can acceptably do and say in the United States, the various ways that you can live your life without being seriously scrutinized, that spectrum is wide. And I actually think this is one of the reasons I never drank in the United States, because although the pressure to drink did exist, it was never all that strong. I lived in a frat house, a fraternity <laughs> during university, but it was an alcohol-free fraternity. Alcohol wasn't even allowed on the property. Now, most people who lived there did drink. They would just drink at different venues, and I didn't take part in that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that within that wide spectrum of acceptable American university student lifestyles, there was an option for people like me, people who weren't interested in drinking. Was it the most popular option? Definitely not, but I didn't get punished for deviating from the group. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do what you want to make yourself happy. You wanna drink your brains out? Go for it. You wanna orient your lifestyle around martial arts tricking? You do you. This is America. We're glad to prioritize ourselves, to deviate from the norm and say no in our day-to-day -day interactions. The very act of doing so is encouraged and nine times out of 10, you're not the first person stepping out of line. This might be why American drinking culture was never really that appealing to me. You see, we're so open in the US, even without alcohol, I never really felt like I was missing out when people were drinking. I'd see my fraternity brothers and my friends from high school drink and they'd all just become louder, happier, slightly clumsier versions of themselves. They weren't drinking to tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. I mean, they told you that, along with the Uber driver on the way to the party. They were drinking to make a good time even better. You wanna play some Halo? All right, I'll grab some drinks. Watching the game? 
Okay, let's get some chicken wings and beer. Going to the club? Cool, let's pregame with some Smirnoff. This is my overly simplistic interpretation of American drinking culture. Americans seem to like using alcohol to amplify existing emotions and feelings, to use alcohol to make a fun time even more fun, to let the good times roll. All right, now let's talk about Japan. Japanese people are known for being hardworking, polite, group-oriented, and risk-adverse. Why? I've talked about this a few times in recent videos, but I speculate that a lot of this has to do with the extreme natural disasters that the people in Japan regularly have to face. Despite being a relatively small nation, 20% of all the earthquakes that happen every year happen in or around Japan, and approximately every century, Japan is hit with a cataclysmic earthquake and accompanying tsunami that essentially brings the country to its knees. There are also devastating typhoons and volcanic eruptions, and I argue that these natural disasters combined with the country's limited natural resources, this is why Japanese people are so hardworking and team-oriented and polite and risk-adverse. Because burning bridges and going against the grain in Japan, this has always been a fool's errand. You need allies around when the next disaster strikes, and it will sooner than later. Anyone living in Japan for at least three years will tell you that they've experienced an earthquake so large that it made them scared. And how do you make allies? By being considerate of the people around you by always politely greeting them, by being careful not to offend them, by always showing up early, by bringing them thoughtful souvenirs, by putting others' needs, by putting the group's needs above your own. This is why the pair concept of honne and tatemae exists in Japan. Honne is what you actually think, and tatemae is what you do and say in the presence of others in order to not upset the peace. Honne is God, shut that dog up, it's been barking all morning. And tatemae is, And unlike in the United States, in Japan, tatemae is the default setting. But you can't always prioritize the group. You also need to express your honne to sometimes blow off steam. You can do that with family members and close friends, but if you've never lived in Japan, you might be surprised at how difficult it can be to get Japanese people to tell you their honne. After graduating from university, I moved to Japan and taught English here for three years on the JET program. During those three years, I spent most of each day with the other teachers at the schools where I worked. And about once every two weeks, or maybe once a month, I would meet up with the other local ALTs. Despite this, despite the fact that I was almost always around my Japanese coworkers and almost never around the other American and ALTs, despite the fact that I was already conversationally fluent in Japanese, I knew almost nothing about my Japanese co-workers and almost everything about the other American ALTs. Why? Because Americans don't need alcohol to express their honne with acquaintances and co-workers, but many Japanese people do. In Japan, nomikai, or drinking parties, provide social catharsis. There's a sort of tacit agreement that anything said or done at Nomikai is okay. That we're all here, we're all tired of pretending, so in a minute when everyone gets their drinks, we're gonna say cheers, clang these glasses together, and for the two hours after that, anything goes. What happens at Nomikai stays at Nomikai. And this is why there are so many work-sponsored drinking parties and why they occur at regular intervals. Because it's a given that while you're at work, you're bending over backwards to maintain the peace. That because of the rules of the society, in order to properly know the people you work with, you can't actually be at work. It's funny, 99% of the conversations I have with Japanese people are, well, they're what you would expect. It's, nagain desu ka, Nihon wa? But if you sit down with that same person at an izakaya, 30 minutes in, it's And in that designated setting, you can actually have that deep, nuanced, necessary discussion and really get to know the person sitting across the table from you. You see, it's not that Japanese people aren't opinionated, it's that in Japan, it's difficult to express those opinions in all but a select few settings. This is why 2chan was born here, why VTubers were born here, why so many people here use Twitter anonymously, and why many YouTubers here hide their faces. Because like Nomikai, these things give people an opportunity to express themselves without consequence, without fear of blowback from the group, without having to give up 
their group membership card. So if you want to truly know Japanese people, I would highly encourage you to consider drinking with them. To which a handful of people will say, Right, but I don't drink. Will Japanese people really not accept me if I don't drink with them? This isn't as true for the younger generation, but I do think that turning down offers from Japanese people to go drinking will negatively affect the way that those people think about you. Because whether or not you're accepted in Japan, in my experience, a lot of this comes down to how many cultural boxes are you willing to check? You speak Japanese, check. You sort your garbage, check. You take part in the mandatory cleaning sessions, Check. You sit in at the pointless meetings and don't complain about how they're pointless. Check. You join in in the rare instances when everyone agrees to stop pretending and speak honestly. By not checking that final box, in a way, you're sort of saying that you don't buy into the premise. Now, this doesn't mean that Japanese people won't respect you or treat you with dignity. In my experience, they will. But I think when the typical Japanese person sees you choosing to opt out, they'll be significantly less likely to lower their own guard. I think that many Japanese people will perceive that action as you declining to sit at the same table with them, literally and metaphorically. I think that will cause many Japanese people to think, ah, to which some people will say, right, but what about the Japanese people who don't drink? Are they no longer Japanese? Well, of course they're still Japanese, but that doesn't mean that the act of deviating from the group goes unnoticed. You see, in the same way that many of us weebs, we studied Japanese because we never felt at home in our own countries, we didn't like being surrounded by loud, self-important Americans, many Japanese people learn English or other languages because they want an out from Japanese culture, because they're tired of the ostracism, the alienation that comes from going against the grain. Each society has its faults and merits, but it can be difficult to properly appreciate either until you've experienced their respective pros and cons. Whether or not you choose to drink, that's ultimately up to you. I don't want you to start drinking for the wrong reasons, and I don't want you to become an alcoholic. Again, I drink maybe three or four times a year. I understand what it's like to have a long, non-drinking streak, to take pride in that streak, and to feel like if you started drinking, you might lose part of your identity. I'm trying to articulate an argument for drinking in Japan that you may not have heard. Whether or not you think it's a good argument, that's up to you. But the argument is not to drink to get drunk because it's fun to be buzzed, but because getting out of your comfort zone for the sake of others is a core pillar of Japanese culture, perhaps the central pillar of Japanese culture. And when you make that effort, Japanese people will appreciate it and they'll return the favor. In my experience, anything that you might lose from breaking your non-drinking streak will be more than offset by the deep relationships that you can have with Japanese people when they see that you're earnestly trying to meet them in the middle. In my experience, Japanese people do accept foreigners, provided the foreigners are doing their best to act Japanese.